Welcome to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Roundtable Panel Discussion. I'm Caitlin Clark and I'm joined by three renowned plastic surgeons and ASPS members. Dr. Joe Hadid, a board certified plastic surgeon with practices in Beverly Hills and Miami who specializes in body contouring procedures. Dr. Darren Smith, a New York City board certified plastic surgeon with a background in scientific research specializing in surgical and non-invasive treatments. And Dr. Danielle DeLuca Pytel, a board certified plastic surgeon with a practice in Troy, Michigan, who focuses on cosmetic and reconstructive body contouring and facial rejuvenation. And we're all here today to discuss the do's and don'ts of traveling for plastic surgery. Dr. Hadid, let's start off with the very basics. What is medical tourism? So medical tourism, uh, broadly speaking, is when patients travel to uh, other locations. Uh, most commonly, I think a lot of people associate it with international travel. Uh, but it could also be domestic as well. And uh, oftentimes the reasons why somebody would wanna travel can vary, but usually it's due to cost. They're really trying to find the, the cheapest deal out there for the procedure that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So you find a lot of bargains abroad, you think? In a lot of countries, it's uh, cheaper for because they offer package deals. So, uh, for example, not only will the price of the surgery be included, but also the hotel stay and any nursing care afterwards. And even with the cost of travel, it's still significantly cheaper in a lot of instances compared to if they were to go to a local plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith, plastic surgery procedures are real surgeries and there are risks even when performed by the best plastic surgeon under the best circumstances. Are the risks greater when patients leave the United States to receive a plastic surgery procedure than if they just traveled domestically to another city? So I, I think that in instances in which patients travel internationally and abroad, um, there's a greater um, responsibility for the patient to really look into what um, standards are like for practice patterns and safety in um, the, the countries that they're going to, because there are certainly places around the world that are on par with, or in some cases probably better than the US for certain procedures. Uh, but what is nice and comfortable for people in the United States is they know that if they're going to a board certified plastic surgeon or a member of ASPS, they're going to someone who is satisfied, you know, at the very least, the minimum safety requirements to be a safe surgeon who knows what they're doing. And we also know that if they're having surgery in the United States, there are standards in place to make sure the operating room facilities are, are also up to snuff. Mm -hmm. And while there are certainly countries and cities around the world with similar standards, we just aren't as familiar with them. So it really becomes um, something where the patient has to do, you know, really dot their I's and cross their T's. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of research or homework would a patient need to do? So that's a great question, and I think actually ASPS is a great resource because ASPS has partner nations across the globe, and that's a great place to start. There's a you know a, a surgeon finder on ASPS where they can go look and they can start and start looking for people that are affiliated with um, members of their um, nation's uh, plastic surgery um, body and affiliated with ASPS, and that's probably a good place to know that you're you know getting a good start. Um, and beyond that, um, doing some research and seeing who the credentialing bodies are of the, of the nation that you're going to and making sure that the surgeon you're looking at is a member in good standing of those organizations. And so what kind of credentialing bodies do you think are key ones to look for? So, uh, you know, it varies a lot by um, location, but I would look for the equivalent of the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like in different countries. And that's why I'm not, you know, why it's easier to default and say, yeah, just just stay here in the US because, you know, we're, we're all fairly experienced. And, you know, while we might have personal colleagues abroad that we can point to and say, yeah, that's, that's a great safe surgeon, there's no kind of standardized way to do that. Right. Dr. DeLuca Pytel, in your opinion, is it safe to travel domestically within the United States to undergo a procedure by a surgeon in another city? Yes, I think you can travel domestically. I've actually done that myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what is really important is to ensure that if you are traveling domestically for a surgery, that you have identified somebody in your own community mm -hmm. that can help care for you after. Mm -hmm. Because when you have surgery in another state and you develop a problem, it is not, that's not the right time to be figuring out who can help perhaps drain your seroma. Um, it would be uh, logical if you were having surgery in another state for that particular surgeon to perhaps call somebody locally and uh, have an arrangement. I will tell you, I have know of nobody who does that, um, <laughs> but I think that would be the way to do it safely. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a lot of instances in, um, in our community in Detroit where people will fly 
uh, to, for example, um, a place in Miami for a surgery mm -hmm. and be put on a plane way too early and return home with not good medical care. Mm -hmm. And I know from people in my community of taking care of these people, people are coming in with DVTs and infections and you know are really left hanging. And what's important for people to know in this country also is that a plastic surgeon and a cosmetic surgeon are not the same. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to a cosmetic surgeon, they may not have board certification. They may not have the same ethics and integrity that mm -hmm. board certified plastic surgeons have. So again, it's important to do, to do your homework. And then finally, I think that if you're seeing the surgeons in your community and a lot of surgeons are telling you no, but you magically find a surgeon in another state who says yes, you really have to determine whether or not that's safe. Mm -hmm. And I will t sometimes tell my patients, I'm telling you no, and somebody else will tell you yes. Mm -hmm. But here's the reasons why I'm telling you no and, and list them yeah. um, because it, maybe this is not a safe procedure for you. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned getting on an airplane and flying a little too soon, you know, after postoperatively. Um, how soon is too soon? Well, post-op day one is too soon <laughs> yeah. with brains mm -hmm. and, uh, and other things. Um, I, as I'm a very conservative surgeon, mm -hmm. so I like my patients to stay in town for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that it varies from person to person. Yeah. Um, it is important also to make sure that if you are flying, that increases your risk of deep vein thrombosis. So that has to also be a discussion with your surgeon about how to potentially, uh, or how to prevent a potentially worse uh, risk of surgery by then compounding it with uh, flight, which is also known to be a risk. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Hadidi, do you have a practice in Miami, which is a city known for its medical tourism, especially for liposuction and Brazilian butt lifts? Why do you think people travel to another city or country for a cosmetic procedure? Like, why would someone go from, let's say, Pittsburgh to Miami for a BBL? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, social media has changed the landscape of plastic surgery. And a lot of times patients are drawn towards a particular provider who may be very prominent on social media uh, or has, you know, a lot of likes and engagement, but that's all the patient really sees. Um, they don't really do their homework and carefully research the credentials of the surgeon doing it. I feel like in most instances, most ASPS members um, are not going to be at the bottom of the price list. Mm -hmm. um, so Miami, for example, it's a big problem because they have a lot of um, colloquially refer to them as chop shops or plastic surgery factories where patients will come in. Oftentimes they won't even meet the surgeon until the day of the procedure and then um, they're discharged from the care of the clinic with no post-operative instructions, no follow-up care. A lot of times they don't even see their surgeon again and uh, they're sent back home and there's no appropriate follow-up care. Uh, they're told if they have any complications to go to the nearest emergency room and patients are just left out to dry and, and essentially fend for themselves. Um, so it's a big problem, and I think when it comes to medical tourism, um, really emphasizing the, well, first of all, educating the public on the risks and the dangers of medical tourism, whether it's international or domestic. Uh, number two, really emphasizing the patient safety aspect of it, that regardless of how somebody may portray a particular procedure on social media, it's not all glitz and glam. There are a lot of serious risks that somebody has to take into consideration when deciding if that particular procedure is best for them. Having uh, appropriate meetings with the surgeon well in advance of the actual surgical procedure. Um, and then uh, really just making sure that, you know, when a, when a surgeon is a board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and a member of ASPS, that patient should feel comfortable knowing that that surgeon is held to the highest standards of mm -hmm. ethics, as well as patient safety. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, I think in my opinion, it is, it is gonna require some sort of uh, advocacy on the state and local level to get more of the state legislators involved to uh, minimize these uh, plastic surgery factories from popping up and, and preventing creep of practice from non-plastic surgeons performing these procedures. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately we want what's best for the patient and safest for, for the patient. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would just add one thing just to, to echo and amplify what you said. 
what was really terrifying, and I don't know a whole lot about this because I've seen it pop up in the lay press and in the media, but now you're getting people that not only are they not plastic surgeons, like we know that other doctors are doing these things, but now we're getting like nurse practitioners and like physician assistants doing BBLs. And I, I, I just don't even know how that's possible. And while some of these things are not the most technically compli technically difficult procedures in the world, we're seeing that there's real nuance to doing it safely. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, you shouldn't be doing a procedure unless you can manage the most severe complications. So there, there are a lot of people out there that aren't even physicians doing real surgery now, and that's not even always that clear to the patient who's selecting that person as their provider. Mm -hmm. I often say that the most challenging part of plastic surgery is not what's done in the operating room. It's making the decision on who you should and shouldn't mm -hmm. operate on. 100% true. So how often would you say you say no to patients? Um, probably more frequently than you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, I will frequently tell people no if I think their expectations are too hard to manage mm -hmm. or I don't think they're safe for surgery. Mm -hmm. um, those, those are really the, the two main reasons. And I'm sure that I send people away who are upset and angry and mm -hmm. maybe they find somebody else. Um, I've actually had people return to me saying I really wish I would have waited. Oh, wow. um, because they had a bad outcome. Have they ever come back to you? Have they ever gotten a surgery somewhere else and then come back to you for a revision and say, gosh, I wish I listened to you? Yes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now, Dr. Smith, you're shaking your head. You're nodding. Does that happen <laughs> to you too? Uh, it does. I, I think that, um, you know, I think probably most people um, here that are, you know, members of ASPS and board certified plastic surgeons, we are by definition on the more conservative end of the spectrum. So we're, we're going to be sending people away and, and you know, Chances are, if we're turning someone away, it's not a good idea for them to do the procedure. And mm -hmm. if they have it done, there's likely going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. 100%. You're never going to regret not operating on someone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's a very good philosophy to live by. Now, Dr. DeLuca Pytel, are there any specific pre-surgery steps that a patient should take to ensure that their travel is conducive to a successful outcome? Yeah, I really think that if if you find somebody who's in another state and they do something that's very unique that you can't find at home, mm -hmm. that you have a conversation with that person, you meet them ahead of time, it's, it's inconvenient, but uh, so are complications. So mm -hmm. travel out to see the person ahead of time, make sure that you understand what your requirements are to stay in town um, before you travel back home, how you're going to conduct your follow-ups, mm -hmm. how you conduct um, yourself if there's an issue. Mm -hmm. Because I do know in our community, the burden is falling very heavily on our emergency rooms. Oh. And um, we all have, you know, plastic surgery is a close-knit community. There's not that many of us. Mm -hmm. And we all probably have a colleague in another state that can help out. Um, I think that knowing who locally you might want to see in case of a problem is probably the, the biggest thing I would I would say it's a takeaway. Mm -hmm. And you'd want to engage that person before you travel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I imagine that, you know, those are the kind of things that are also not going to um, keep the surgery at a low cost right. because, <laughs> you know, nobody is. You're paying for two plastic surgeons. Right. <laughs> right. But if it's, again, if it's something super specific, um, you know, it's, it's your health and your mm -hmm. life. So you should take all, all the precautions. Now, do you feel like people search for surgeons outside their own community because of varying standards of beauty? You know, because what's considered beautiful in LA is perhaps not what's considered beautiful in Texas or Florida or Maine. Do you feel like that's a big driver of why people seek it elsewhere? I think it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hadid, now that you have two practices, um, what do you think? Do you feel like people are searching for it based on um, aesthetics? Yeah, I think that's a primary factor. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. There are geographic variations with regards to what patients are looking for, what their expectations are. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, they'll come in and they'll show you photos mm -hmm. of somebody that they want to look like. And obviously, you can never make somebody look like somebody else. Um, I always tell them, you know, we could try to make you look like the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely variations with regards to what patients are looking for. Interesting. And now what would you say patients in your Beverly Hills practice are looking for versus your patients in Miami? So in uh, California, I think it's more facial mm -hmm. uh, oriented versus Miami. It's more breast and body. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith, what's the recovery like for people who travel to see you in New York City for a procedure? How long do they need to stay in New York before returning home? Sure. So, um, you know, over time, as we've kind of built up our kind of international patient base, we, we've kind of developed partnerships with local hotels where we kind of 
this is where they're going to go. This is the kind of care that they can expect. We have, you know, nurses that we send, so they're really kind of catered to it every step of the way to make sure that they're first safe and second comfortable. Um, in terms of the amount of time that they're with us, um, it really varies by procedure. So for some of the minimally invasive things we're doing, like energy-based body contouring and neck and face rejuvenation, that might just be a couple days. But if we're doing, you know, a major body surgery, you know, that could be two weeks. So it really is kind of tailored to the individual patient. The other thing that's a little um, less apparent is it's not only important to line up the aftercare for patients coming in from abroad, but the pre-care, which we touched on, you know, you need to establish rapport with them over time. But the other thing is actually just very practical, which is you don't want someone flying in the night before a big procedure because we kind of touched on DVT or VTE risk a little bit. And just to go through what that is, a venous thromboembolism is a blood clot that forms usually in, in your legs, can travel to your heart or your lungs and be very, very dangerous. Um, and the risk factor, one of the risk factors that amplifies that is, is being immobilized for a long period of time, right? So that's, you know, we, we think the risk of that is most amplified for the six week period after a surgical procedure, but you can also amplify the risk of that by being immobilized shortly before a surgical procedure. So in an ideal world, you'll have someone travel to um, your surgical center in advance of their procedure and then make sure they're well hydrated, they're up and they're mobile so that you're not actually starting your operation on somebody who's already at increased risk for a venous thromboembolism. So it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to stay for a total of Three weeks depending on the procedure. Yeah, for a big, you know, if we're doing like a big mommy makeover with breast surgery and abdominoplasty where we're going to be monitoring their drains, we're going to be looking for any post-operative complications. Yeah, that, that sometimes is the commitment. Wow. And do you require them to come back to you for their post-op um, check-ins? Yeah. So um, again, it depends kind of exactly what the procedure is, but I will generally um, have someone do at least one in-person follow-up before they leave town. Mm -hmm. That's a big commitment. Yep. Dr. Hadid, in your opinion, what is 1,000% a don't when considering traveling for plastic surgery? Um, I would say don't base your decision solely on cost. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, that is why most patients choose to go for medical tourism, uh, but it ends up being the wrong reason. Like we discussed earlier, uh, very frequently they'll have complications that will require revisions, and then they end up paying more ultimately financially than they would have initially if they would have just gone to uh, maybe a board certified plastic surgeon. So um, I would say avoid cost as the primary determining factor. Mm -hmm. Would you say overall kind of the risk outweighs the benefits? I, I would say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in most instances. Now, you know, as, as we kind of touched on, there are certain instances where medical tourism can be safe uh, for the patient, um, especially if it's uh, to go see somebody that specializes in a particular niche procedure. Mm -hmm. But I would say in the vast majority of cases, uh, the procedures that they're interested in could be performed locally by a board certified plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. DeLuca Pytel, if, if a patient is flying to and from a surgery, we touched on this, are blood clots something to be a little nervous about? Sure. Um, I would be very concerned if a patient had a tummy tuck and then got on a plane three days later. Oh. Um, because we know with some of the techniques of abdominoplasty where we are tightening the abdominal muscles, mm -hmm. that, that increases intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and that can cause clots in the, um, uh, the pelvis and yeah. uh, that combined with the mobilization of being on an airplane and the fact that you just had surgery and you're not super mobile anyway right. can really increase your risk. Does the altitude uh, play a factor or does it not matter if you're flying or driving? It's just as long as you're immobile, that's it's, a risk. As long as you're immobile. So if mm -hmm. I have patients that are coming to see me, Michigan is a state where if you could travel from one to the other, it could be 10 hours. Oh, wow. um, if patients are seeing me from any farther than two hours away, I, I request that they get out and they just take a walk around their car a couple of times just oh, wow. to increase their mobility and decrease that risk. Mm -hmm. And so how important is ambulating and walking? Is it important after every plastic surgery procedure? Any procedure done under general anesthesia, mm -hmm. um, it's important. Got it. Dr. Smith, for patients considering traveling to another city for a plastic surgery procedure, what is the number one do that you'd recommend? Intense research. Um, and it's hard enough to choose a plastic surgeon where you live, especially I'm in New York City. I mean, I joke there are more plastic surgeons than pizzerias in some portions of Google Maps when you zoom in. So it's really hard to cut through the fray and, and choose someone in your own city. Mm -hmm. So if you're going abroad, you really need to, to do your homework. You need to 
again, go back and make sure they're the equivalent of board certified where they are. You need to look at what kind of um, preoperative and postoperative care is in place, and you need to make sure that there's a very safe system for you to be present locally uh, after your procedure, and then there has to be a system in place for follow-up uh, when you get back home. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, surgery is not just the two or three hours on the table, it's the, you know, month before and two months after the procedure. Right. And Dr. Hadid, you touched on what you called chop shops or, you know, what did you say, factories? Plastic surgery <laughs> factories. Yeah. And so for those instances, what are, what are some red flags if a patient is researching and they aren't quite sure whether this could be considered one or if their facility is one? What are, what is a red flag? So if um, they don't have the opportunity to meet with the surgeon who's actually performing the yeah. procedure before the day of surgery, I would say that's a huge major red flag. Seems important. Um, oftentimes, uh, they may not even meet with a medical provider, not even a PA or a nurse practitioner. They may just meet with a, essentially a sales consultant. Um, so I think it's important for the patient to find out who it is that's going to be speaking with them. Um, also, the facility where the procedure is going to be performed, mm -hmm. um, how many ORs are there? Are there board certified anesthesiologists who are going to be administering the anesthesia? What's the certification of the facility, the accreditation body um, of the facility? So I think those are the things that patients need to look out for. Are those easy to find? I think it's, it might be a little bit more difficult to find the accreditation uh, status of the facility. Um, however, um, if they, again, if they don't meet with the surgeon who's going to be doing the procedure before the day of surgery, then I would say it's best to stay away. Mm -hmm. You're, again, nodding with Yeah, people. I mean, so, you know, there, there are different practice models in, in, in plastic surgery, right? And I think one, one thing that's cropping up is you, is you have these, like, enormous conglomerates of, you know, can't name them, but you know, these companies that, that really are that, they're, they're kind of like sales companies and you call their central call center and you'll, they'll have their office in you know, um, Ohio, they'll have their office in New Jersey and, and so on. And then you'll say, okay, I'm in Ohio. Then you'll go here and see one of these eight providers. And then they'll use the word provider. You won't know if it's a plastic surgeon, a gynecologist, or a physician's assistant. Mm -hmm. And you may not know until you show up. So I, so it, it's, again, I think that transparency in plastic surgery is a huge problem. And, and the real kind of difficult thing is that there's only transparency at the highest and safest levels, right? If you're a member of ASPS, you're a board certified plastic surgeon, you're required to have transparency. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, nobody's enforcing any of this. Right. So it's a very difficult problem to solve. And maybe patients don't even know what to look for, 100 right? 100% right. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself having to educate patients when they, prospective patients when they come to you for their consult? All the time, mm -hmm. all the time. I, I think that because we have so much more visibility than we used to have, it seems like everybody's having plastic surgery, mm -hmm. which on the one hand is great, but on the other hand, we're all so busy in our lives and everything has now been shortened to a tweet and a reel <laughs> and they're you know, not even a minute long. Mm -hmm. um, people don't recognize that what we're doing is, I mean, this is real medicine, it's real surgery, mm -hmm. and your body really has to recover. So mm -hmm. there's, there's always a, an education sort of wow that you know here's how fast your body recovers so here are the things that you can do them physically but you shouldn't do because mm -hmm. you're going to prolong your recovery or you're going to expose yourself to more complications um, education i spend most of my time during a consultation educating my patients on on the things that they should expect and there are a lot of times where they would say that they don't they'd never heard that before wow that's really Terrible. <laughs> Dr. Hadid, any final thoughts? Just to follow up on that, I think they are getting a lot of their education from social media. Mm -hmm. So they'll come in and they'll say like, oh, so I can go to the gym later on after my surgery that same day, right? It's like, no, not really. Um, so I think there's a lot of good information on social media, but there's also a lot of misinformation as well. And unfortunately, it seems like the, there's a correlation between the more sensationalized a post or a reel is, the more misinformation there is associated with that. Mm -hmm. But that's what draws patients to a particular post or a particular provider. So it's very incumbent upon us to really reinforce and educate the patient on the risks and the recovery. Mm -hmm. And just because you're traveling doesn't mean that the recovery can be expedited or abbreviated Correct. in any kind of way. A recovery Correct. is a recovery. 
right? You can't, also can't pay more to recover faster. That's a good yeah, point. That's yeah. a really good point. We'll, we'll conclude on that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Hadid, Dr. Smith, Dr. DeLuca Pytel. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for having us.